a lot to do, right? <laughs> so very, very welcome all of you to this session which is about um, capacity development and training for co-production. And uh, I will be very short, my name is Henrietta Palmer, I will be very short here to introduce the panels, but basically I want to say that we know that this in, in this room there is a lot of experiences as well uh, from different types of trainings and different types of uh, capacity development. So we really want to use your knowledge and expertise on this and to work as much as possible together with you. But we will also uh, hear from uh, five experiences, one, two, three, four, five, yeah. uh, six, no, five experiences uh, across the different platforms uh, of, of different more formal arrangement and formal uh, training situations that has taken place across platforms and across this period of, of 10 years. And the questions that we have asked to ourselves and that we would ask to you are the questions that are there. Uh, if we want to do co-production, transition and co-production, what kind of competences are needed? Because I think all of us experience that after being through a project, you realize you learned a lot, but it would have been good if you would have known a little bit of that beforehand, so you wouldn't have spent all the time of trying to figure out what you should learn to be able to, to research together. So there is first a question, what competences are needed? And the second question is, how do we train them? I mean, there are a number of methods around, and we will give examples of different methods, but also different kinds of situations, I think, when, when competences can be trained. So, our first, uh, I, will, I will not host this workshop, but I will hand over to Maddie Hubbard in a minute. Uh, and Maddie represents also here the, the Shepherd Manchester platform and is the co-production lead at the Greater Manchester Health and Social Care Partnership, where her role is to promote, support, and embed co-production in health and social care across Greater Manchester. And the broader program she sits within is working to shift the culture in health and social care to be more based around what matters to people and to communities. And her partner here today is, will be our first speaker, Katie Finney, who is also from the, representing the Shepherd Manchester platform, and is the co-founder of the Amity uh, SIC. I don't know if you call it Am Amity is fine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you're also a member of the Jam and Justice Action Research Collective that we have heard about a little bit already, yeah. where she's been co-leading the process called Coalition for Change. And from this process, a series of action learning sets have emerged, which means bringing people together from across sectors and settings uh, with interest in developing co-production co uh, capacity in Greater Manchester. So you will speak from these uh, uh, experiences of these three sets of explorations. Uh, our second speaker will be Eva Maria Janssen from Goalit, but she will also speak here from experiences working across two platforms, the, the Gothenburg platform and the Kisumu platform. And Eva Maria is a researcher in marketing and tourism uh, at the, Sco the School of Business, Economic and Law at the University of Gothenburg, currently working in a transdisciplinary project on the role of tourism in multicultural societies, and we had a workshop before lunch on this, and also involved in various projects within a network called the Maritime Cluster of West Sweden, which is about innovation to enhance sustainability in the maritime sector. And as I said, you will speak here about from your own PhD experience of collaborating not only with another PhD student, but also with uh, Kenyan PhD students and trying to set up basically your own PhD program uh, in a very, very new field. <coughs> and then our third speaker is Jennifer Patient, who is replacing uh, Jenny Viney with a very short uh, very shortly, uh, and Jennifer is Jenny is also a PhD student in the Relax and Just Cities team at the University of Sheffield, <coughs> and her research is in collaboration with the Trade Union Congress in Yorkshire, looking at the dyn dynamics and capabilities of trade unions in response to the low carbon transition. And her background is in education and community campaigns, uh, and they, this this led her to take on action research approach and motivated her to work with others to set up the action research peer network, uh, which is uh, set up to support PhD students uh, trying to do action research. So that this is where you will, what you will speak about. And then we have Sarina Patel uh, from the Cape Town platform. And Sarina, as many of you know, were the former coordinator uh, of the Cape City Lip, uh, 
uh, in the first phase of Mr. The Futures. And then she managed the knowledge transfer program. And you also, some of you heard about this uh, in an earlier session today. And Sorina's input for this session is based on the training provided to the city exchange program where selected city officials spent two months at the university working with academic counterparts to publish their experiences and practices of policy development in a range of sustainability related areas. And in order to bridge between practice and academia to co-produce these outputs, intense, intensive training was offered to the city officials to support the writing process. So Sarina will reflect upon this training and its role in addressing questions of power and relevance in knowledge co-production. And finally, I will speak from the experiences of designing and setting up and running for two years a PhD program uh, at, in the, at the Gothenburg platform, which also invited practitioners together with PhD students to explore different methods for co-production, but also to learn about key concepts in transdisciplinary research and also about how, how you evaluate this type of research. So now I hand over to you, Mary. Uh, thank you. Um, so just to kind of orient you a bit about what's going to happen, we're going to hand over to you next just for you to start talking to each other and kind of drawing out your kind of curiosity and what brought you to this room. How does this topic connect to what you're currently doing or challenges you're facing? How does it resonate with you? Um, and after that, we will come back to this panel of women. It's really nice to be part of an all-women panel. Um, and I'm just going to ask each person just to speak for a few minutes to draw out some kind of learning and things that interested them or that they've kind of gathered from their experience. And then we're going to make more of a conversation to really think about what connects the different experiences, what the kind of challenges people might have shared or the opportunities, as well as kind of the differences from different contexts. Um, so that it becomes more of a conversation and we'd love to also hear from your experiences if you've got something to offer in to the conversation. And after that we'll kind of pick out the key kind of themes or the key kind of questions that emerge and have kind of smaller table discussions and move around those so that it's as kind of participatory as possible rather than just us speaking from the front. Um, so yeah, first we'd love you to just speak to the person next to you or a couple of people on your table and have a think about how you'd answered these couple of questions. So what are the competencies you need if we're really serious about co-production as a way to kind of solve you know, um, societal problems and realise urban justice? Um, and then how can we really develop them in a meaningful way? Um, so yeah, it'd be great to, if you'd like a chance to chat and hear your initial thoughts afterwards. Thank you. And we'll do that for about 10 minutes. Lots more chance for conversations during the workshop, I promise. <laughs> 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 Is that? <laughs> 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 we'll have more time to chat in a minute. Right, so, um, please hold on to those conversations, those thoughts, as the context for the following kind of discussion. Um, so we're going to offer in some reflections from these practitioners and scholars who all have their experience drawn from very different contexts. And then after each person has had a few minutes to introduce themselves, we're going to open up to you guys to ask maybe questions that emerge from your initial discussion or for thoughts that we can kind of discuss between us. So first, I'm going to invite Katie to speak. Hey, okay, that's all right. Yeah, thanks, right. buddy. Um, hi, everyone. So I won't introduce myself because Henrietta very kindly did that. So I'll launch straight into... Um, the experience I'd like to share about of capacity building from the perspective from the, of the Jam and Justice project and specifically the coalitions for change that we developed um, about six months before the end of the Jam and Justice project in the hope that we would create a, a network or a, a coalition with which we could share more widely, bring into our process and outside the process our learnings and integrate everybody's learnings across Greater Manchester because co-production is something that is happening in lots of different spaces and lots of different spheres and it really developed over the, the three years of the Jam and Justice project. So we set about um, delivering three events in order to, to reach out and reach in and exchange and through the process of those Coalitions for Change events various connections were made 
and various calls for what might happen. And one of those was actually around capacity building for people from across sectors, across experiences in Greater Manchester. And it was through the Coalitions for Change that Maddie and I got together and it also emerged as very popular amongst everybody, the idea of action learning sets as a process by which we might learn more, support each other, and also find our own routes to solutions to the challenges that we face in the practice of co-production. And so we recruited from across the network some volunteers who wanted to be trained as action learning facilitators and supported by uh, the Greater Manchester Health and Social Care um, budget and also the German Justice budget. We are about halfway through the process of those action learning sets. So we did the training of the facilitators from the network and now those are in the process of being delivered. And the, um, the three sets that we are running are focused on three areas of interest around which it was identified we wanted to build capacity in Greater Manchester. And that was a group who are interested in, in understanding how co-production and they can build capacity to create system change and creating a lo local participatory ecosystem. How, co how we might create conditions for active decision making, including people with lived experience. And um, one specifically focused actually on skills, space and capacity building. But what's been really interesting about the process, whilst what happens in each individual set, which is a small group of around six people who come together to go through a very specific process of learning, um, that there are some common themes emerging. So whilst although they got together through one of these themes, <coughs> we were able to pull out from the non-confidential reflections that we are noting down, some common things that are emerging. We're not at the point of sharing those yet, they're still, still forming. Um, one minute left. But, but the process of action learning has been really interesting, and the process of the Coalitions for Change has been really interesting. So the, the principle of the Coalitions for Change was to open up the process of jam, jam and justice for everybody to share and to identify what capacity we needed across Greater Manchester. And specifically the action learning sets give individuals the opportunity to look at very uh, live challenges in their practice and work through those challenges and identify for themselves what action they may take to um, overcome that challenge. So the learning is through the self, supported by peers and held accountable by peers who you come back to and report your progress on that action. So it's gone from quite a global kind of sharing to a very individual development and integration into practice. So hopefully that inspires you with some questions, some thoughts, some ideas um, for later on. Perfect, exactly four minutes. <laughs> Great, so next I'd like to pass over to Eva Maria. Okay, so uh, I'm from Gothenburg, as you heard, and uh, uh, I worked um, in, on my, in my master's with a, a student from uh, design, I'm from marketing. Uh, so we already had a collaboration uh, um, uh, uh, across discipline, disciplines, and we know, knew each other very well, starting our PhD studies together. Uh, and I think that was part of why it was successful in a, in a sense with it, 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 our project that we ha we were so close, um, but but that was also uh, I think uh, hard for the PhD students in Kenya to tap into uh, because we were we were so close and had our methods and had our, our thoughts of what it should be about. It was about ecotourism in Dunga Beach, which you might have heard during the previous session here with uh, Lilian. Uh, she was not part of our group then. He, she has come in uh, later, uh, but we work with the other PhD students there. And um, uh, what what happened was that we we started um, immediately with uh, using our methods uh, mainly from design, uh, but also SWOT analysis and all these types of uh, methods. Uh, but the Kenyan students they were not, I think, prepared for that we would come and start working uh, um, immediately with those methods and involving people because they had uh, uh, they had to have a research proposal uh, uh, in one year they they should have that accepted and then they could go out in the field so that was a problem for the group work um, 
but they, anyway, they, they, they did that anyway and did that and still they could do their proposals. We, we found ways to work together, but it was not, it was not easy with this, uh, this collaboration. I, and I, what I think was good and I, what I want to say about this is the time for reflection that is so uh, uh, important that you have your individual reflections <coughs> As we did when we were in Kenya, uh, three weeks at a time, we always kept our diaries where we put up, down our own individual reflections and also on what happened during the day. Uh, but also, we, me and Helena had, uh, the, the, the other PhD student from Sweden then, uh, we had a lot of reflections during our breakfasts and lunches and dinners and I mean we were all, all the time together. Uh, so we could reflect together. But also sometimes we also had um, uh, group reflections with the other PhD students and I think that was really really important and I think that you need to uh, put in a lot of time for reflection maybe scheduled time for reflections in such uh, collaborations uh, so I think that is more the, the most important method uh, and also the visual methods that we used uh, all, both in relation to the practitioners and the residents uh, that we used a lot of, you don't have to have a language, a common language, if you have visual methods, or, or it at least it makes it, it makes it so much easier if you use vis visual tools uh, in these processes. Uh, so yeah, methods, visual, visual methods and reflection, I think, I want to say. Brilliant, thank you very much. Good Perfect, so next I'd like to pass over to Jenny. Thank you. Yeah, so I've been reflecting on how uh, me as a PhD student, you know, what kind of capacity development did I need and how has that happened or not happened? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the Action Research Peers group that came out of that. So when I became a mature PhD student, I had a lot of experience transferable skills that were relevant to co-production. And I already had an idea of my research project um, I had an a academic background that was sketchy in some ways, but it was quite well tailored to the kind of research and the kind of interest I had. Uh, and I had a good network and connections. I had a community I was already working with that I wanted to do the project with. Um, so you know, we were we were ready really to get stuck in. Uh, some of the barriers that came up at that point were with the ethics procedures. I remember my very my university interview. Um, being told, oh, you won't be able to do any field work for the first year. Again, with this kind of model that you have to just produce your um, proposal in the first year and then it will be ethically approved and then you can get out in the field. But in fact, uh, due to the fact that my supervisor is Beth Perry and we found lots of ways around that and there was an initial ethical approval and a memorandum of understanding. So there were some tools that we kind of like used and developed to get through that, that barrier. Um, methodological training was also a bit of, of a bit problematic it was a bit kind of generic and didn't really hone in on the things I wanted to know about how to work in a participatory way how to do action focused research and there was definitely a lack of a community of practice and you know that's a good way for me to learn to have people who you can talk with about um, the, the kind of work you're doing and I, funnily enough I had to kind of go to Cape Town to find that <laughs> some of that so it, um, it, you know it's there in different ways in the end we had a seminar with David Greenwood, who's a, a famous US action researcher, and that was really, really fruitful in bringing together different PhD students with different problems, and we said we we're gonna form a network and call it the Action Research Peers. Jenny Vine, who was meant to be speaking today, was very, um, took a le really leading role on that, and she started part-time her PhD a couple of years before me. Um, and what she said about some of the issues she had, she had a massive long, problem with uh, ethical approval for her participatory work. Um, no, she said no one had the confidence to approve it because it was a kind of outside of their expectations and, and knowledge. And there wasn't the inter this interim process to go through at that stage. And she got involved in uh, 2015 in an earlier version of the AR Peers Network. And she said there was a lot of definitional discussion about what exactly is participatory action research and you, you probably you, you all know you can get quite bogged down and, and that kind of thing um, but then we we did myself Jenny and a couple of other people from urban studies 
did get a new version of the network off the ground, got a little bit of funding, ran some events, including a colloquium where we got some outside speakers in. And what was great about that was they told us about them, their, the, their methods as well as you know, what they found out in their research. They were telling us how they organised their research. Uh, and we also had some more informal peer forums. The difficulty, I think, with it is how we keep it going because we're now all like third year PhD students and we're, you know, kind of like can't put much more effort into that. But we're trying to think how can we help people new coming in. And we recently put some comments into a consultation called Fit for the Future, which was just about social science leadership capacity in, in Sheffield University and wider. Uh, and they are very much saying, in addition to more traditional <coughs> academic skills, the evidence suggests there is a need for social scientists who are able to work effectively with research, with research users and have experience of working in non-academic research-relevant environments. So, you know, yeah, it is out there that this kind of stuff is more needed, but it still feels like we're going against the grain. Okay. Thank you so much. Cool. Right, so next I'll pass over to you, Sue. Great, thank you everyone. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about the City Officials Exchange Programme in the first phase of Mr Urban Futures where we had city officials who were brought out for two months of their time who came to the university to co-write publications and papers with, um, that went to international and national peer-reviewed journals um, which they wrote with academics at the university. So I'm going to be talking about the support structures and the training that we put in place to enable um, the, these, these interactions to occur. And just a little bit of background. So as uh, someone mentioned in one of the earlier presentations this morning, the idea behind these co-produced publications was about, uh, the ambition was about making policy more legible on the one hand, but also making policy decisions more defensible um, from, from a, a decision-making point of view. So it seems like a bit of an odd choice to write a publication. However, publications were seen, uh, this was something that was driven by the city. The city really felt that publications was the way to go, firstly because of the legitimacy of academic knowledge, but also because of uh, establishing an institutional memory within the, university, uh, within the city to have uh, papers that were published about policy processes. So if we had to think about what uh, the process that we followed and the capacities or uh, what is it, more commonly called now comp competencies um, uh, in terms of what to train about and how to train. Um, I think the first point was about selecting the right sorts of offici officials and the right sorts of academics. So the people who were in the program was a really important set of decisions and selection uh, uh, process. Because I think not everybody can do this kind of work. Um, so it really required very particular, the selection criteria were really important. We, we got in the writing centre of the university and two academics from the education department to help with the training of um, um, the city officials. In the first workshop, they looked at the differences between academic and practitioner writing. In the second workshop, they looked at the application of theory in the writing up of, of papers. And in the third workshop, they compa critically compared an academic paper to a policy text looking at the same issue. Um, and so there were three rounds of workshops that the city officials were, uh, were exposed to. And the competencies were really around academic writing, argumentation, and representing research. What we learned from the process was that actually it wasn't just the city officials that needed um, training. There was the assumption that academics knew how to write academic papers. But it's not so much about the process of writing the academic papers, but more about the co-writing of academic papers. And this was something that we learned. Was, so as we went through the different state, first and the second and the third lot of city officials that came to the university, we increasingly made spaces for the city officials and the academics to work together in these workshops. In the first work, set of workshops, it was only the city officials because we assumed that they were the ones that needed training. But actually, what we've learned is that the training was about a training to work together in a co-produced way that was more significant than these particular skills. Because I think that what's really important that, as we all know, knowledge co-production is about engagement, negotiation, exchange, compromise, and learning. And the kinds of skills that are required to do those things are not those hard skills around writing, but really around much more social skills, softer skills, um, which, which can only really come together by having both partners exposed to the same sorts of, uh, in, in a space to engage with one another. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <coughs> 
Right, so finally, Henrietta, okay. we come to you. Thank you. So I will speak from the experience of uh, uh, designing and running a, a PhD course that also invited practitioners. And I did this together with Merit Polk, who some of you know, uh, at the Gothenburg platform. And, but I would like to start to say uh, something I read recently, that competences are contextual. And they cannot be trained in a vacuum. So for, for in our case, the context was uh, the theoretical context of realizing just cities, but also the, the local context, the Gothenburg context of realizing just cities. Uh, and that meant that we organized a course around uh, three teaching narratives. So the first narrative was a substantive knowledge that was needed to, to understand and problematize this theme of realizing just cities in terms of literature, scientific literature, but also in terms of real life examples from the Gothenburg uh, city, policy, also policy document and case studies. And the second narrative was around a number of methods that could be suitable for transdisciplinary research uh, that was explored together with uh, skill for professor, professionals and facilitators who we brought in, but also uh, setting up different type of working uh, situations. And the third narrative, which was around developing transdisciplinary pedag pedag pedagogy as a space uh, organized in different transdisciplinary learning situations in different ways bridging different knowledge cultures. So that meant to bridge uh, the different cultures and silos that was represented by the different practices, uh, the different, to co-learn from practice-based case studies, to learn uh, as reflection and action, but also I would say importantly to learn uh, student and teacher uh, jointly. So it wasn't necessarily us learning the student, but learning together. So the source of departure for our um, to find out which competences have been trained were both theoretical and experiential. Uh, and if you go to the literature on transdisciplinary research, you can broadly see uh, competences for TD research framed as normative competences on sustainability, competence for making integration of different sources of knowledge to happen, and knowledge about and skills for facilitation and reflection, which has already been mentioned here. But we also looked about competences that are described from sustainability, education for sustainability, uh, which are which you can find in the literature, but and also the experiences that we had from our own evaluative work where pr pr practitioners have reflected on um, at large the process design and, and the skills to be able to organize this type of processes. So it, at large, I could frame this as five uh, strands of competences, uh, which we paired with different methods and different uh, or organized in different learning situations. So the first strand is around uh, an ability to grasp, grasp complexities uh, and a system thinking competence. And here, of course, there are a lot of methods around systems thinking. A second strand is around to deal with uncertainty and changing circumstances and to have an anticipatory competence. And we try to practice this through scenario uh, methodologies. And here we used explorative scenarios. There are a number of scenario uh, methods. The third one, as already mentioned, the normative competence and ability to take diverse perspectives into account. And here we use the method called perspective awareness, where you also take into account your different assumptions, what, where they come from. Fourthly, uh, interpersonal competences, strategic competences and competences for reflexivity. And this is a lot about the, the knowledge and skills that are needed to design the process, but also about facilitation, the knowledge and skills that are needed to facilitate processes. And at last, uh, the competence and ability to continually test and communicate results throughout the project and to make integration of knowledge to happen. And this can, of course, be done in a number of ways. You, you described here uh, different type of prototyping and using visual methods. Uh, the collaborative writing is also one way to have actually knowledge integration to happen through not only as an end result, but as a, as a research inquiry in itself. So, one concern is how different pedagogical approaches to learning determine different outcomes. And uh, if you look into transformational learning pedagogy, for example, it requires to have assumptions challenged in order to have to develop a different perspective than the one that you previously held. And this situation is sometimes referred to as a, as a threshold moment, uh, a situation when confusion is present, from which new perspectives can emerge. And I think confusion is important, but it's, to it's tolerable only when there's a sense of trust, care, and reciprocity in the, in the situation. And this, I think, shows the importance of having very intense relationships when you do transdisciplinary research. And in our case, these intense relationships were created by the fact that we had a very mixed setup by mixing practitioners and academics, which 
evoked a newness and a curiosity and a care for each other. But also about the continuously presence by everybody, uh, also by us as trainers. So it's not, it's not a teaching situation which you can kind of leave, uh, mm -hmm. but you have to be there. And to also that together with the student have continuously joint reflections that you pointed at of what could be done differently. In, in total, I think this created a sense of trust that was uh, necessary. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and um, thanks to all of you. So that was a lot to process. So I've got a lot of ideas and provocations in the room. Um, I'm gonna totally abuse my position of chair to ask the first question, but then I'd love to come to you guys next. I'm just really interested. We're all speaking from very different contexts. But what struck you as kind of commonalities that emerged? I feel like Henrietta, you pulled out a few while you were speaking, but maybe anyone that spoke earlier, is there anything that struck you as kind of similarities that kind of came out from different people speaking. I completely agree that Henrietta almost did a yeah. wonderful job there of, so, of <laughs> summing up um, and covering a, a lot of, of the commonalities actually. But what, what the word that really stuck out for me that, that covered that was the key of, or the, the importance of relationships mm. and therefore understanding what we need to build strong, trusting, open, uh, relationships with our fellow human beings and if we start there then the tools and processes and contexts um, merge quite naturally if we're paying attention to the space of reflection and care um, for all the people involved in a process I'd say that was common mm. I think reflection relationships and mm. reflection those, were the, those spaces for reflection mm. I very much agree with both of those comments. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So, anyone from the floor have, have a question they'd like to ask the panel? Yes. Um, pointed out earlier to find the ones that are really interested from the beginning <laughs> not to tackle the ones that you already know is is impossible to to well, work so so from my perspective as a practitioner whose home is in the what we call the voluntary community and social enterprise sector that way of working is what we do it's a necessity uh, the collaboration across organizations but also within and across communities it brings with it the varying hierarchies varying backgrounds varying expectations and power dynamic um, so maybe reach into that community and see what can be learned there but also i would say if they're opting in that's a great starting point mm -hmm. and I would say if you truly believe in what you're advocating or offering and stand for that uh, with clarity they'll be receptive they'll be confident as a starting point for you um, 
But what we're always doing in context of, of co-production, in the context of co-production, is trying to blur boundaries for everybody, including ourselves. So asking people to step away from what they might be attached to. And if anyone else in the room has something they'd like to offer in that, definitely feel free. Amanda, do you want to come back on that specific? I think it's... Yes. This comes up, I'm probably going to get into that later now. Um, but actually, if you're working in, depending on the context, how you do co production is partly defined by what it is you're co producing. Yes, absolutely. So if you're coming from a background of, for instance, engineering, mm. what you're co producing might actually be very practical. Yeah. Mm. And the, the more personal engagement side of the co production approach might not actually necessarily even be. It's, you need to leave egos and entirely opposite the door. That's why it's really, really collaborative to generate new ideas. But apart from that, yeah. and you'll find that people who come from those disciplines are actually really quite excited about innovating on the edge of, of their own disciplines mm -hmm. and giving them a space in which they can learn from other, other strands of the same discipline, different species of engineers. Oh, sorry, did you want to come back on that one first? Or? Yeah, is it a new question or are you adding to it? No. Okay, go, go uh, ahead yeah. and I'll follow. Uh, yeah, I, I think one of the key things that came up in um, the dinner presentations was at what point do you identify your frequency? Because I think I was following from your presentation where you say when you're working with your colleagues in a team, maybe they're very ready to you know, to just get on with things, but they have a different so my question here, I think Liz can address this, at what point do you identify those differences mm -hmm. so that you can begin to work with those mm -hmm. before you get, you know, you sit around the table and then you don't know where, you already know who to lean into next, who to mm -hmm. take advice or give your, but it seems as if you get into this co-production and sign up for some of the things because it's a trend mm -hmm. kind of thing to do, mm -hmm. who would want to opt in to something like that? So if you, if I don't opt in, Or probably, as an academic, as you know, with that strong scientific background, might 
the prompt. I already know that this is going to be a challenge, but I guess, but then what? How can we put that together? So at what point do we identify this situation? Because I think that is crucial. Mm. And, we, and you know, making space for these discussions to take place, and if it's this one kind of thing to take place, and not just expect one side, you know, to lean too forward and, you know, meet the other person. So it's about creating these balances, because I think often that's the challenge. You're working with another person. There are a lot of assumptions, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rena, you have to say. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to answer your <laughs> question directly, but I think that you, I, I'm, ju I'm going back to Dorothea's question about the senior leadership kind of opting in. And I think that actually people don't have a choice anymore because of the way in which the funding landscape is shifting and which, which you just reiterated in your, in your comment. Um, and I think that, um, uh, but opting in doesn't necessarily mean that they've bought into it, <laughs> right? And that's the question you're asking is how do, th how do you then move from opting in to buying in? Um, and, and I think that here one's also got to think about who, what are the diff who, whose role what roles do different intermediaries play in the process? <coughs> and I think that having, having facilitated processes with external agents is really important for bringing different parties together and creating spaces for reflection. Because I think that when, when, it, when, when it's the academics that are running a workshop or whatever it might be, it sets up a particular power dynamic. So you've got to try and neutralize that so that in coming up with differences, both uh, or the multiple partners um, can in, in a, not that there's ever a safe space, I don't believe there's ever a safe space, but in a more, <laughs> in a safer way, articulate what it is that they're willing to give up because I think that's really important is there is a, there is a give and take um, and, and what are you willing to give up in that, in that relationship, uh, but in a, in a more abstracted, <laughs> in an abstracted way of asking a, a question rather than in a direct, you see what I'm what I mean, yeah. And it will differ depending on the issue and the project and the the players that you're looking at. I mean, just a little thought that what might be useful in building that kind of space is is action learning as a process. Mm -hmm. Now there are different ways of doing action learning, but it, it can be about being a peer who actually helps somebody to work on their own problem. And I agree that problem solving is important. So that, but that kind of brings it into a space where actually I could help an engineer with their problem, even though I don't understand the engineering, by helping them with their learning process. And that kind of, if you can create that kind of environment, it might help. Can I put a quick word in there? Yeah, please do.
yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I absolutely agree with you. It's not for everyone. It's not for every project. And I think that the, one of the things that I spoke about in the session before this was uh, the importance of also maintaining institutional integrity. How much can one bend um, in terms of crossing boundaries? And I think that boundaries are there for a particular reason. Institutions are set up for particular purposes. And it's what you do when you go back into your institution. So I think that there are certainly limits to co-production. I, really, I don't believe in a model where it's everything co-produced together at every step of the way. I think that there's a real value in an asymmetrical reciprocity where there's a space of moving back and moving out of that relationship to do what you, it is that you do best and what your mandate is. <laughs> um, so that might be a bit controversial, but I, I think that there's <laughs> there are different kinds of, of co-production as well. Cool, so I think we've got time for one more question before we start having smaller group discussions and kind of continue this conversation a different way. So has anyone else got a question they'd like to ask panel members? Yeah. Thank you, that was really interesting. Uh, just one question about vision matters, if you could elaborate more on that, that would be really interesting. And one general point, I'm, I've got a project in the Transformation for Sustainability Programme, and the second grant, it's all about co-production, but very few projects are actually doing it. And it's almost like you, it, it's co-production has been bought, so it's mm. become like a big buzzword, and mm. you know, whether it's, it's obviously been done beautifully in this urban future. <laughs> but you've shown the time, the investment, you know, all of the stuff that goes in. So I think how do we push back against that? Because in our project, we do have NGOs and academic bonds that mm. have been doing things for a long time. And mm. I think it's it's been very interesting for the academic to, to ha point out sort of some of these nitty nitty gritty questions around hierarchy, power, sustainability, you know, in a so-called transformative project, whereas it's the NGOs all about often getting it done. And that, that kind of dialogue has been really important. But I find that the government officials are really not willing to engage and they really then find it too compromising. So it would be interesting to know, you know, obviously it's great that you guys work so well with government, mm. but it's not often the case because I think it's too challenging. Can I just say one very quick thing? Okay, go on. I work with some people in government. We work well with some people in government. <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. Visual method, should we go to that first? Uh, yeah, what we did uh, was um, starting uh, having a process of uh, um, making a prototype, uh, testing that, evalu evaluating it, and then starting a new process, uh, more or less. So, we, like with the waste system, uh, we, we started with sketches together with the, the residents, and then we, we uh, built some kind of uh, first model of uh, a waste management system. Uh, and then try that out, and uh, and then we th we we continued with other types of uh, um, waste uh, points. <laughs> uh, so that was one way of doing it. And then we also had an available project space where, where people could come where we, when we were not there to see how the project had evolved since last time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, and also we had a, an a, a, um, idea box. What is it called? Yeah. Uh, where they could put their own ideas, and also we had there were, were, were people in in this space where where they could also talk to other when, when we were not there talk to other people uh, that worked there, uh, and um, yeah, so we used a lot of sketches and uh, and yeah, prototyping. Uh, also with the guided tours, we had uh, also wrote uh, or, or had large sheets of paper where we drew, drew the the tour and seeing what the spots were. And then we, we did that also uh, as a test in real life and evaluated that. Uh, yeah, that's more or less how we did it. Anyone else got something around the kind of visual Well, I, I'm the first to acknowledge the importance of visual methods. Uh, I didn't mention that here, but my background is uh, running a transdisciplinary program within an art context, uh, so there was the visual, the methodologies were at core, at the center, and I, when moving into a more purely academic context, I lack uh, intensely the visual, uh, the, the use of visual tools, uh, and I think there's a lot to do there. Uh, I think there's so much to bring in to, to visualize this type of work, which is 
also as a tool, uh, and I mean to work with different kind of presentation formats, to work with exhibitions, to work in different ways with publications, uh, to do work with mapping. I mean, we tend to work on post-its, that's mm -hmm. the most visual stuff yeah. we, do, we do. But, uh, to, and, uh, and sometimes you need to bring in people who have those skills, because if you cannot expect, I mean, as you just said, you know, we have different skills and we shouldn't necessarily become each other, but mm -hmm. we should use the different skills that we have. So I think it's important to also bring in people who have that, those kind of skills of visualization. Uh, graphic designers and, and artists and designers so that we can prototype stuff but I can also visualize things. Mm. So I think there's a lot, lot to explore there. Uh, much more work to do. Mm. Cool. And then the second half of it was how we hold on to co-production and not let it just be co-opted or become really watered down. Mm. Anyone got a major from that? Looking for spaces for co-production between sectors. Table. <laughs> <laughs> but, but maybe it's a controversial statement that we, you know, not everyone needs to do it or should do it. Anyone else from anywhere in the room have something to share for the benefit of everybody, really, that you will take away from this session? No? <laughs> it's, yeah. For me, it's, it's valuing facilitators. And um, I work in a university, and facilitators are almost non existent. And there's so many terrible meetings, wastes of time, and you just think, power is reinforcing itself over and over again. So there needs to be a, a pot for facilitators or an incentive for universities to have more facilitators, both within the university relationships and across between universities and other sectors. tempted to end on that, it was positive. <laughs> <laughs> but we have got room for one more person if you've got something to share. Yeah. <laughs> Only positive. Yeah. We'll end on that. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.